Good morning, everyone. Good to have the opportunity to share with you again as part of this series on living on purpose. And uh, it's been a good series so far, finding our purpose and living that out, walking that out. We've called this particular uh, message, Avoiding the Drift. And it reminds me of something that happened to me quite a few years back. I was in my early 20s and I did uh, night shift work for a very short period of time, mainly because it didn't agree with me. Um, Some people like nurses, other people who do shift work, I am in awe of you because you just managed to get into that ebb and flow pattern. But it did not work for me. And so I was uh, really exhausted by the end of, uh, I think I did it for a month or something, and, and by the end of that time I was... I was falling asleep everywhere. And, um, and so I was driving home from work one morning. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'm nearly home. And, and my eyes started to do that thing. You know when you're watching the television and it's late at night and you used to start to do that a little bit? Which is fine when you're watching the TV. It's not dangerous when you're watching the TV. It is when you're driving a car. So, uh, you know, I was kind of doing this and slapping myself on the face to wake myself up and... And, uh, and then the last time, I just closed them a little bit longer than probably what I should have. And when I opened them again, there was a semi-trailer coming towards me. That was a bit exciting. I had drifted onto the other side of the road. And so I very quickly drifted back onto my side of the road and fortunately made it home. It was fine. The semi-trailer was several metres away, so it was all good. It's similar in life that when we take our eyes off the road, we lose sight of where we're going, we start to drift. Let me draw you a little uh, diagram here. If life was perfect and was simple, it would look like this. It would just be one nice, big, long, straight line. But we know that life is not like that. Life is not perfect, it has its bumps, it has its detours, it has its distractions along the way. And those things can throw us off. So whether it's because we take our eyes off the road, like I did, uh, or at other times it's because of external factors, things that are out of our control, they can uh, uh, throw us off our purpose. And last week, Pastor Tim talked about finding your purpose and what that was all about. If you went here, jump onto the YouTube channel and and check that out. It was a great message. But this week, I'm talking about once you've found what your purpose is, how you keep that and how you avoid drifting from it. Now, some of you might be hearing words like calling, purpose, ministry. You're thinking, I'm doing everything I can just to turn up on a Sunday and sit and listen to the sermon. What is this all about? Well, I want to encourage you to hang in there because as I'm sharing this morning, I trust that God's going to give you some practical um, steps and, and tips and perhaps get an insight into the, the, the Christian walk is more than just believing, but it's putting legs on that and outworking your unique shape, the thing that God has called you to do. Now, just very quickly, we often talk about our, our shape, uh, which is this little acronym here because we are all uniquely shaped uh, in God and we have a purpose in Him. And so that refers to S for spiritual gifts, something that's imparted from God, not something of ourselves. Heart or your passions. A is for ability, so that's more about your natural abilities. Um, uh, P for personality or your character. And E, your experiences, good or bad. All those things shape us into uh, uh, uniquely... Uh, in a way that God can use us. Now, if you want to dig around a bit more on that stuff, you can check out the book there, Shape, by Eric Ries, and um, encourage you to do that. But that, that's not our focus this morning. I want to look uh, at a passage this morning. So if you've got a Bible there, flick it over to 2 Timothy chapter 1, or Bible app, you can follow along there. We'll have the Scriptures up on screen as well. I want to uh, talk a little bit about First and two, Second Timothy, give you a little bit of background to them before I start, because um, these were letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to a younger ministry that he was mentoring called Timothy. When Paul met Timothy, 
It came at a time, in fact, we, we read about it. If you've done your life journal reading for this morning, if you're following along our journal reading pattern, um, that was Act 15. You would have read it this morning or you will read it at some point today. Uh, there is a, a situation that happens. Paul was travelling with uh, his friend Barnabas. And so they're doing ministry together. It's all going quite well. Paul says, well, let's go back and visit some of those churches that we've already been to. And Barnabas says, yeah, great idea. I want to bring our friend John Mark along with us. And Paul goes, uh, no, nah, we're not taking John Mark along with us. He deserted us last time. He's let us down. No second chances. And the Bible says they had a severe disagreement about it, a sharp disagreement about it. They really fell out over this. And so Barnabas says, well, fine, I'm taking John Mark and we're going. And they, we go, went off in one direction. And Paul says, well, I'm going to go with my friend Silas and we're going to go back and check out those churches. And so they go their own ways. We don't hear anything about Barnabas and John Mark after that. That's as much of their story as we know. Anyway, we don't know whether it's weeks or months, but it's in that time just after that that Paul and Silas meet Timothy. And they meet his mother and his grandmother, meet the family, and they're encouraged. Paul sees something in Timothy. And I think he's been reflecting. I think Paul has gotten to the point where he's looking back and he's saying, do you know, I didn't handle that situation with John Mark very well. I think he was probably right in his conviction, but the way he handled it was not the best. And so he's been thinking, and he, there is now a fundamental shift in the way that Paul mentors. And instead of saying, well, you need to come along with me on my journey and learn from me that way, Paul becomes all about empowering Timothy in his journey. And so that's why he writes the letters, to encourage, to uplift. And they don't spend a lot of time together, but he's constantly encouraging uh, Timothy. So with all that in, in mind, I want to give you this morning five tips for avoiding the drift, all right? And I'm going to do it in reverse order, pretty much because I can, all right? So we're going to start with number five. We avoid the drift when we mutually uh, um, encourage uh, others. When we allow them to encourage us and we encourage them. When we're on a journey... We don't do it alone. In the Christian life or life in, in general, there are other people who are on their journey with us at the same time. And when it comes to Christians, we're not in competition with them. We're doing life together. In fact, there's lots of examples throughout the New Testament where it talks about the unity and the, and the, and the unity of believers. It says that whenever two or three are gathered together there in his name, there Jesus is in the midst of them. He says a, a two or three uh, a, a stranded cord is not easily broken. In other words, when there's only, only two or three believers come together, there is strength in that unity. The whole purpose of Paul's letters, as I said, was to encourage Timothy, but also to acknowledge that Timothy was an encouragement to Paul. Let's have a look at uh, from verse 6, just the first little bit of this. Paul says, For this reason I remind you. All right, what's the reason? Well, you have to go back over the couple of verses beforehand, the introduction to the letter. And what Paul says is, Hey, I'm reminded about your mother, about your grandmother, about the strong faith that they had. And I am convinced and I'm encouraged that that same faith now resides in you. And so Paul was saying, hey, I'm encouraged by that. So now I want to encourage you. Because of that, I want to remind you a few things. We need the support of others and we need to mutually encourage them in their journey. We really are better together. Sometimes that can just roll off our tongue. Oh, we're better together. It's so true that when we work together in unity and harmony, something happens. What's that scripture from Ephesians 5.19? Speak uh, to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't always communicate through song with people. I don't just walk up to, like, I don't go into Tim's office and we don't just start singing to each other, do we, Tim? <laughs> Not very often, anyway. 
When Tim's tired, he starts rocking out. It's like the 80s rock. That's about, you can tell when he's tired. But we don't kind of... Amazing grace. How sweet. Come on. <laughs> You've lost your opportunity now. That <laughs> saved a wretch. Like him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness we don't communicate like that. Wouldn't that be weird if you just kind of... I can see the love in your eyes. It's creepy. <laughs> I don't think the verse is talking about communicating through song. Life is not one big musical. What it is talking about is that when you have a revelation from God, when God's put something in your spirit, might be a, a, just a, something you've read in the scriptures that day, something that you've observed, something that you've got from God. You know what? He says, talk about it with others. Share in that experience. So if God gives you a revelation through, through a psalm, through something, if he's put something in your spirit... Share it with each other so that you can be mutually built up and encouraged in that. Isn't that good? So I want to challenge you this week. Look for opportunities to have those God conversations. Parents with your kids, teachers, students, uh, employers with your employees. If, they, if you know uh, you're in relationship with Christians, encourage, build each other up. It's so important. We can't do it alone. All right. Number four, we avoid the drift by keeping passionate over passivity. This is a really big one. What happens when a car runs out of petrol? Anyone? It stops. Very good. It stops. And when we lose interest, we might be going along in our journey and everything seems to be going fine. It looks like we're doing okay. But things start to slow down a bit. We're not as excited about things. And very soon, we find ourselves off track. We're going through the motions, routine, but we forget why we're doing what we do. And so we start to drift. And at first, we don't even recognise it. Because the problem didn't happen up here. The problem happened back here. Don't wait till you're lukewarm to sort things out. When you start to run out of petrol, when you start to slow down and you become dead in your tracks, it's really hard to regain that momentum. Don't wait till you're lukewarm. Look what it says in Revelations chapter 3. Now, this was John writing to the churches, his revelation to the churches in the area at that time. And so this is God's word to those churches. He says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. So he's just saying, you're going through the motions, but there's nothing in it. You're doing the work, but, but there's no heart in it. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Some translations say, vomit you out of my mouth. Isn't that lovely and graphic? I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. How many of you have ever had a, a, a glass of warm water, lukewarm water? It's revolting, isn't it? You take a sip and it's just like, Bleh. you want to spit it out. That's what God feels like when we're just going through the motions. So if you stop caring, if you ho-hum about things, you're just going through those motions, remember this. Look what Paul said to Timothy in verse 6, the rest of that verse. He said, fan into flame the gift that you've been given. Keep it red hot. Be passionate about it. You have a gift. God has shaped you uniquely. Everything that you've been through to this point, God has shaped you uniquely and he wants to see you use that and he wants to see you passionate about using your gifts. Um, when it says, you know, fan into flame, have you ever been to a camp, you've seen a campfire and people are sitting around and, and it starts to die down a little bit, what do you do? You don't just say, oh, well, the fire's gone out, so let's all go home. No, you stoke it back up again, don't you? You get in there and you make those little embers and you, you fan them back up into a flame. That's what God wants us to do. I remember a few years ago, I was visiting Pastor Ian Miller in our, C uh, in our CRC church in Sydney. Ian was here uh, at, at this church for many years before that. And uh, I got to church 
just after the service has started, so I didn't see Ian, he was already on the platform. And so the first time he saw me was when he was up there, and he goes, oh, hi, Nathan, good to have you here. And he starts telling the church who I was from his old church. And, and he says, you know, when Nathan was young, he used to come into my office, and he used to say, Miller, what are you preaching on this week? And without fail, Ian would usually say something Jesus-y, which was really helpful. And I'd say, no, 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 give me more detail than that. So then he'd tell me what he was preaching on, and I'd say, okay, give me a bit of time, and I'd go away, and I would write a a song, and I'd come back and say, oh, look, I've written this song, what do you reckon? He goes, yeah, great. And we'd do it as an item or or a chorus that, that week. And so Ian is telling his congregation this, and I'm sitting there thinking, I'd forgotten all about that. I really used to love doing that. Maybe maybe I should do that again. So I'm thinking this. Anyway, Ian's gone on with his message in this time. And he starts off with Revelations 2.4, which says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forgotten or forsaken your first love. Go back and do the things you did at first. I'm sitting there going, Wow, God, what are you trying to say to me? I don't remember anything else that Ian preached. Uh, that day, but it reminded me, you know, where things have gone a little bit lukewarm, come back, stoke them up, and I did that, we came back and wrote some uh, songs for different things, a stewardship campaign and, and things like that, because it was a gift that God had given to me, and I want to use it for His glory. We don't need to be afraid of getting off track with these things and messing things up either. What does it say? Uh, In verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Some translations say fear or timidity or cowardice. We don't have to be afraid. I was reading an article just a couple of weeks ago that uh, was saying they've done a study over the last few years and in the last five years there's been a severe increase of cases of anxiety and depression in teenagers because they have the fear of missing out on what their friends are doing on social media if they're not engaged with that. Severe, by 50% or something, it's, it's huge. There is this fear of missing out or not being connected with, with their friends on the virtual uh, world, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is. And it's crippling. They're afraid that they won't be in on the jokes if they're not checking their, their uh, social media feeds. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to live in fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what does it say? A spirit of power, love, and of self-discipline. When you walk in His strength, in His power with Jesus, you don't have to be worried about doing it in your own strength. We walk in Jesus' strength. This is the way you stay passionate. When you walk and, and you exhibit His love to others, when you operate that kind of a spirit. It's very easy to stay passionate because you see the love of God at work in the life of other people. And by operating that spirit of self-discipline, staying on track. So I'm not going to go drifting off here. I'm going to make sure I do the things that I used to love to do, stirring up that passion. I'm going to stay on track. Some of you might be feeling that way this morning that you feel flat, you might feel empty, passive about your relationship with God. Stir up that gift. Remember what it was like when you first met Jesus. Stir that up. Be passionate about it. There's no one else can do it for you. You need some time to get renewed and refreshed. What happens when the the car runs out of petrol? It stops. We've got to keep our petrol tank on full, yeah? Keep topped up. And that will keep us on track. All right, number three. We avoid the drift by keeping on track in times of adversity. So this says we might be going along, everything's going all pretty good, and all of a sudden, whap, something happens and it throws us right off track. It's not our fault. We weren't expecting it. It just happens. Life gets in the way. So maybe it's a relationship issue, somebody's let you down, maybe it's a loss of significant material possessions, car, house, maybe it's losing your job, maybe it's been the death of a loved one, 
Maybe it's your, your own health issues that you might be facing. Or world events. We already heard about what's happened in, in Paris in the last couple of days. And that can throw us right off track when it's unexpected. You kind of go, God, what is going on here? I don't understand this. As part of getting some perspective on this, we have to remember that suffering is a part of life. We don't have to like it, but that's a reality. Suffering and pain are a part of life. And God does not delight in our suffering, but he does have a purpose for it. He may just want to show us things along the way that we would not have seen otherwise. Have a look at verse 8 of what um, Timothy said to Paul. He says, So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Uh, Paul was in jail at the time when he wrote this, towards the end of his life. He was under house arrest, but he was physically pretty worn down. He says, Rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Paul's saying, in other words, look, you know what? Bad things will happen. There will be times when we suffer. There will be times when there's persecution. Don't let those things throw you off track. And he reiterates that in verse 12. He says, this is why I'm suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed. Notice he doesn't say, I know what I've believed. He says, I know whom I've believed. Because what we believe can let us down sometimes. We don't know everything. We get things wrong. But if we believe in Jesus and we trust that he holds all things in the palm of his hand, that he makes all things new, that he works all things together for his good, then we don't need to know all the details. We trust that he has it under control. A couple of years ago, I wrote a little book with Pastor Barry Silverback, who is our CRC International Missions Director. He's been a a missionary for almost 50 years, 50 years next year, actually. And and he has had an amazing life journey. So we wanted to write up some of that. And as we talked, he shared with me just some incredibly uh, challenging and confronting stories of the difficult times that he went through. He said to me, everyone loves to talk about, they were in revival in Papua New Guinea for something like 17 years, people getting saved, healed on a weekly basis, stuff was happening. He says, everyone loves to talk about that stuff. He goes, but nobody talks about the persecution. He says, we were persecuted every week, sometimes daily, without fail for 17 years. There would be rocks thrown at our cars, smashing the the panels and the windows. There were riots going on. Some of the church members up in the highlands were actually murdered because of their faith. And just some incredible things that you think, my goodness, how do you keep going through that? And so Barry actually quotes that verse, verse 12, in saying, I know whom I've believed. And then he says this, These truths revealed through Scripture and to which we wholeheartedly believe are what kept us balanced and ordered in our inward life. Such a conviction also enables us to order our outward world over which we don't always have control. Ordering our inward world empowers us to stay ordered in our outward world. Some of you here this morning, maybe you have difficult circumstances going on in your immediate world that you feel like have really thrown you off course. Have you ordered that inner world, the inside, knowing who you believe, putting your faith and trust in him so that when you hit the rocky times, you know who you can rely on? So important. That's why it finishes off that verse, verse 12, where he says, I know whom I believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him. If you've entrusted your life to him, he will take care of it. So we don't need to be anxious or worried about things throwing us off. And I want to say to you this morning that if you feel like you've been thrown off track, if life's knocked you down to the ground, Jesus is there with his hand outstretched and he's saying, come on, let me lift you up again. Get back up again. Keep going. 
And who knows what might happen along the way, you know? Between this point and getting back on track again, who knows who you will meet or what will happen that God wants to wants you to learn from. All right, we're nearly done. Number two, we avoid the drift by keeping the purpose always before us. This is a really important one. If our goal or our destination is constantly before us, it's always much easier to see where we're going. So if we know what we're working towards, we can see it. This is about knowing why you do what you do and keeping it before you. A little bit like a spiritual compass, right? So if you're going trekking and you know you want to be going north, okay, you're following the compass, yes. Oh, we're a bit off here, okay. Yep, no worries. We, we, we readjust and we work our way back. And so, But you've always got it before you, so you know what direction you're going in. Keeping your purpose always on your mind, on your heart, always doing something about it, reflecting on it. Paul put it this way when he wrote the church uh, wrote to the church in Philippi. He says, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. I push on. I keep pressing in there. Keep moving on in him, always keeping it before me. Paul knew his purpose and he knew how to keep it in mind. And that's why he was actually modeling it for Timothy when he wrote to him. Look what he says from verse 9. He says, he it being Jesus, Jesus has saved us and called us to a holy life. Paul was well aware that he was not called to just keep on living in sin and doing things the way that he'd always done it. He was set apart to live a holy life and that he had to do something about that. So God does a work in us, he enables us, he strengthens us, but he had to be faithful and obedient to that. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. So Paul says, hey, I put my own desires, my own purposes to one side, and I'm now honing in on that, which is so much better, the purpose for which God created me and called me to. But it's now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who's destroyed death and he's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, so the gospel message that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son to come and live and die a terrible death so that we could be forgiven, also that we could be reconciled to the Father. This gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. He lists them off. Boom, boom, boom. Why? Because Paul was well reflected on what his calling was, what he was called to do. So he was a herald. He was there to literally speak out the gospel and to, to share it, to make a noise and let people know about it. An apostle... So somebody who just goes out and starts new things in Jesus' name, creating communities and groups around that. And a teacher. Now, you've got to remember, Paul's sitting in jail at the time of writing this. He's not just twiddling his thumbs going, oh, well, I can't be an apostle. I can't go out and start things. No. What's he doing? He's writing letters. And he's inspiring and he's encouraging others to do that. So, reflect deeply. And reflect often so that you know your purpose and know that you're on track. A lot of people aren't terribly self-reflective. They don't like to do that. Um, I don't consider myself to be a deep thinker, but I do like reflecting on things. and, And I usually have three little questions that I ask myself. One, what did I do well? Two, what did I not do so well? And you have to give yourself an honest evaluation. And then three, how could I have done it better? A little bit like Paul. I think he had that kind of reflection when he had the situation with John Mark and afterwards, how could I have done that better? Now, if you've forgotten everything else that I've said this morning, that's okay, I won't be offended. But if you've missed everything, make sure you hear number one because this brings all the others into line. If we get this one right everything else will flow out of it. It's probably going to come as no great surprise that the main way to avoid the drift is by keeping our relationship right with Jesus. That is central to everything that we do. And sometimes we try and overcomplicate it with all the things that we do and 
but actually it's keeping our relationship right with Jesus. That's the, the centre of it. Look what Timothy, uh, Paul said to Timothy, verse 13. He says, What you've heard from me, keep it as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Uh, the King James Version says, Hold close to the form of this good teaching. In other words, when you, when you press up against something, what happens? It either leaves an indent in you or you leave an indent in it. And I think what Paul is saying here, he's going, hold so close to this good teaching of Jesus that your life and doctrine are inseparable, that you will be known for being a follower of Jesus wherever you go. So important. And then he says, verse 14, he says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives us. Guard that relationship. Cherish it at all costs. Jesus, your saviour, make sure you're doing all that you can to cultivate that relationship. We have a wonderful hope in Jesus. Do you believe that? Hope is what will renew our strength. Look at what the, the prophet Isaiah said. This was some 700 years before Jesus was even around. It's still true for us today. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and will not faint. Is that good news this morning? If your journey is becoming a challenge or a struggle or a fight, whether you feel like you've drifted of your own accord or whether you've been thrown off by the circumstances around you, it doesn't have to be that way. God wants you to soar. He wants you to be able to run. He wants you to be able to do this journey for the long haul. Amen? Let me finish with this. When Paul wrote his letter to Timothy, he was in the last days of his life. He was physically very worn and, 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 and broken down, not in his spirit, but, but physically. He was in his 60s. He had uh, received a lot of persecution, a lot of physical abuse. And so he was reflecting on his life at this point. And look what he said at the end of the letter to Timothy. He said, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. And he knew he was coming to the end of his life. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do you long for his appearing? I want to encourage you that you have everything that you need in Christ Jesus to keep the faith, to do this for the, the long haul. We have people here of all ages this morning, whether you're starting out in your journey or whether you're coming towards the end of it. Jesus wants to see you finish it well, to get over that finish line. Some of you might be saying, hey, I don't even know if I've started my journey with Jesus. I've never invited him into my heart. Hey, you can do that this morning. Most important decision of your life, stepping into eternity and having Jesus transform your life on the inside. Let me ask you this. How's your journey going? This is the time to be a bit reflective now. Are you encouraging others in their journey and being mutually lifted up and encouraged by them? Are you keeping passionate about your purpose, keeping your fuel tank on full? Are you ordering your inner life so that you can face the storms of the outer world when they come? Do you know your purpose and how to keep it before you? And most importantly, is Jesus at the centre of your life? Jesus being at the centre of our world, that our every thought, our every motive, our every decision flows out of our relationship with him.